warm welcome to today's webinar. My name is Roxana Claudia Tompa and on behalf of the International Dialogue Center, CAICID, I am pleased to introduce to you the first session of an upcoming series of exciting webinars hosted by the Program for the Social Inclusion of People Seeking Refuge. Today's topic is on integration through education, opportunities for refugees and migrants in Europe, and will be discussed by our two speakers, Mr. Barry Van Driel and Ms. Claudia Killer. But before we plunge in into our topic, please allow me to brief you on the house rules. First and foremost, please mute your microphone if you haven't done so already, as this will ensure there is no background noise when our speakers are presenting. This will also allow us to keep the flow of the conversation going. This presentation will have two independent contributors, and at the end, we will have a Q&A session where our speakers will address your questions and comments. Please do take advantage of the format of the webinar and send in your questions even during the presentations. This way, you can take priority and we can uh, have a look at your inputs and pose your questions first. You can see this option at the bottom of your screen in the chat section, as uh, so many uh, guests have already used, starting using it, and we're happy to see that. Please also take a moment to introduce yourself when writing a question and perhaps even state your country or representative organization. Also, take note that this presentation is being recorded, so if you'd like to go back on some of the ideas that we will be talking about today, or even share the webinar later on with your fellows or within your community, the webinar will be made available on CAICID's website and on its affiliated YouTube channel. Last but not least, as there are still technical challenges all around us and we are tuning in from different parts across the globe, if anything is interrupted, please be patient as we're working very hard to address all logistical issues. And now let's proceed into our topic. Our focus for today will be on exploring the role of education in the social inclusion of refugees and migrants, specifically to the context of Europe. This goes in line with the work of the International Dialogue Center, CAICID, which promotes dialogue and supports the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. It also follows closely the work of the PSR program and the Network for Dialogue in particular, as the two recognize that successful integration is vital to preventing newcomers from being the outsiders of the host communities. Acting as a platform, the Network for Dialogue gathers secular and faith-based organizations, as well as academics, working through different activities, aiming to contribute to better social inclusion of refugees and migrants in Europe by using dialogical approaches. In different European countries, the network members also work and develop leading educational programs in order to provide support, especially for children and youth with refugee or migration background. But more on the topic of education and on its impact on refugees and migrants will be shared by our speakers. As such, I am pleased to introduce to you today our first speaker, Barry Van Driel, who will talk about education that is about, through, and for refugees and migrants. Barry is a senior staff member at the Anne Frank House and the current president of the International Association for Intercultural Education. Additionally, he has been a senior education consultant to the Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights and a consultant at both the Fundamental Rights Agency and the European Commission. Barry, thank you very much for accepting our invitation today and for joining us. The floor is all yours. Thank you, Roxana. And I need to add to all that, the father of uh, two children who are at home and not in school, and I'm taking on a new role as uh, I'm now pretty much homeschooling my kids. Uh, I'm very excited to be able to do this. Uh, it's, I think, the first time I'm really addressing an audience I can't see, so I can't look around the room and see who I know and who I don't know, so I'm going to have to guess. But maybe there's some uh, less distractions this way. Uh, first, before I get started, I, I do want to address the title, uh, and I appreciate very much uh, the focus of this webinar. Um, when we're talking about integration through education, I, I think it's critical to reflect on the word integration for just a moment, that when we're talking about migrants and refugees, that integration, in my view at least, and also in the view of the European Commission that I do a lot of work for, is not seen as a one-way process. Uh, integration does not mean that, uh, that refugees and migrants need to uh, assimilate, that they need to acculturate, that they necessarily need to adjust in, in a single direction. Um, the European Commission is quite clear when it does this work around migrants and around uh, refugees, that this is 
supposed to be a dynamic two-way process, meaning that adjustments need to be made on both sides for those individuals coming into a new society, but also the necessary adjustments of society itself. And that's critical because in so many models, when we talk about integration, we're talking about young people or adults that they have to sacrifice their, their background, their culture, uh, knowledge about their history in order to adjust complete to the whole society. So I think it's important uh, before we get started to reflect just a little bit on that word integration. Now, this is a title, Education About, Through, and For Refugees and Migrants. They are different. I'm going to elaborate on that a little bit more as I go along because I think that uh, they are distinct if you're talking about educating about refugees or educating about migrants, educating for them, so providing education for refugees and migrants, and also through the, uh, the metaphor that I have here, or the, the, let's say uh, the other model is education about through and for human rights, which is much more common. I haven't seen uh, education about uh, refugees and migrants referred to as the way I want to do that right now. Um, very briefly, it's already been mentioned a little bit that I work part-time at the Anne Frank House. I'm only going to mention these things in terms of how they relate to the topic of what we're doing here. Uh, part-time at the Anne Frank House because of the, of course, the Anne Frank House, where I'm responsible for international teacher education, uh, focuses on the life and times of a young girl who was in hiding during the uh, Second World War, Anne Frank. The Anne Frank House is shut at the moment. Uh, we do a lot of work uh, around issues of uh, migrants and refugees using uh, Anne Frank as a starting point. Uh, the intention is to open again in October, although it's very unclear. As the president of the International Association for Intercultural Education, which is a, a larger global organization, uh, we focus oftentimes on the issue of migration and on refugees. We publish the journal Intercultural Education six times a year. We did a special issue about three years ago on uh, education for uh, refugees, and we did a special issue, a separate special issue, on education about refugees. So. Uh, and if you look at the other uh, publications that we've done throughout the years, this is oftentimes the focus of intercultural education. Anybody's interested in that journal or interested in the association, let me know. Uh, the, uh, the fact that I'm an expert for the European Commission's working group, there's a special focus there on inclusive education. It's a term that used to be reserved for education for individuals with disabilities, but that's been broadened in recent years. And a lot of people, because the word integration is sometimes misperceived. A lot of people are moving towards the word inclusive education. Uh, what the European Commission's working group does is it brings together policymakers from throughout Europe and also Turkey, uh, throughout Europe together to focus on policy issues that relate to inclusive education with a major focus on issues such as whole school approaches, such as refugees, such as migrants, and such as also segregation and education. Finally, the head of the jury of the UN Intercultural Innovation Awards, if you, and you can Google any of these things, that is uh, a, a, an initiative by the United Nations that takes place every other year, where uh, we give an award to the, the best intercultural projects from around the globe. Many of those also deal with migrants and immigrants and refugees. But more importantly, I think uh, for all of us, and I don't know the backgrounds of people who are uh, part of us, uh, part of this uh, webinar today, um, I think it's important for all of us to reflect a little bit on our own stories and why we do the work that we do. I think all of us have chosen a, a profession uh, where we're working with refugees and migrants, where we think, well, maybe if we had done something different, we could have made more, more money. However, we really oftentimes, those in this profession feel that we're doing this because we think that it's, it's more of a mission than a job, that we're really trying to help others who are in need, we're trying to help others who can use the expertise that we have. So my story, very briefly, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but this young man that you see here on the screen is not me, but this young man could be me. Because when I was that age, around the age of 13, my hair is not quite that color anymore. Uh, when I was at the age of 13, my parents, who were Dutch immigrants to the United States, decided that they wanted to go back. They became homesick, like many migrants do, and also refugees you get to be homesick. My parents 
were fortunate. They had the privilege that they could make that decision to go back to the Netherlands. And we took the boat at the time, there were not so many airplanes, 1970s. We took the boat back to, uh, back to the Netherlands from Montreal at that time, because the boat left from Montreal. And I spent many hours standing at the railing, that kind of a railing, looking out at sea, as I saw the country where I had grown up, where I had my friends, where I had developed my identity, I saw it getting further and further away from me. Initially, there were about a thousand seagulls following the ship. Everything was thrown overboard. And the second day of those 1,000, there were maybe 200 left. The third day, maybe 50 left. The third or fourth day, maybe there were 10 left. By the fourth or fifth day, there were no seagulls left, and all I had was the sea between me and the country where I grew up. And this was, this is pretty much my story of leaving the country where I grew up and having to move to a country that I hardly knew, where I did not speak the language at all. And I think uh, oftentimes referred to as one and a half generation. So uh, an individual who was not born, I'm now in the Netherlands, not born in the Netherlands, but I came here when I was 13. And what one needs to realize is that for the one and a half generation, it, it is quite a distinction between first and second generation where we had to make that move at a time, many of us where we were developing our identity and we had our friendship circles, but we had to make a move that went against our own will. We did not choose to move. Uh, we were told by our parents that we were moving oftentimes with only a little bit of a notice. So this is pretty much my story. When I came into the Netherlands at that time, 1970s, it was very much a sink or swim situation where I was dropped in a classroom with my pretty much American background into a Dutch classroom where I did not speak the language and I was just dumped there. Um, there was very little support for me at that time. Uh, I was just expected to adjust to what was happening in the classroom. I was told I would eventually learn the language. Uh, there was nothing in the curriculum that reminded me of my old curriculum, nothing in the curriculum that reminded me of my own country. Uh, like I said, there was very little support. And also in reading books, reading materials, I did not read anything about, not necessarily my own country, and I think that's important, but not about the journey. My journey of leaving the country that I had held so dear at that time, I have different impression at the moment, but at the time, uh, that was all I knew, um, and there was very little to recognize the journey I had taken, and I, of course, did my best to try to adjust as much as I could. However, I think I was only partially successful. Moving on. The title, Teaching About, For, and Through. Now, teaching for migrants and refugees, I don't want to say a lot about refugees. It was not my experience. I was not a refugee. I know that Claudia is going to be talking more about, the, about refugees, so I'm not going to focus much on that. But I think, especially thinking in the time of COVID-19, and I do want to refer to that just a bit, what we see in general when we're taught, teaching for migrants and refugees is that there is not enough in place to support them in their educational careers, that they do not, to use the words of the United Nations, they do not fulfill their full potential. And I just have a couple things here on the screen, that if ESL is not English as a second language, but it's early school leaving rates, in general across the, the EU are almost twice as high. And this is especially the case for, when we're talking about migrants and refugees, for girls. If you look at the general population of the, of the EU at the moment, the higher dropout rate or early school leaving rate is among boys, but among migrant groups, it's girls. This is going to probably be exacerbated at the moment because of the present situation. What we also see is that these, where the real problems tend to be is the school work transitions. So what happens after high school? That there are many challenges for individuals who have a migrant background, and individuals who are refugees, making that move from the school situation to the work situation. This is where there's a tremendous amount of dropout, and this is where there is too little support at the moment. Then teaching about migrants and refugees. I know that the people who are attending this and listening at the moment from around the world, but I think what you find in many places around the world at the moment is that teachers are ill-prepared to teach, not only teach migrants and refugees, Almost no teachers have that kind of a background. 
but also they were very poorly prepared to teach about these issues. And you can make a distinction, and this is what the research is showing, especially in Europe and North America, between the overt biases that teachers have and the subtle biases that, that teachers might have. For instance, overt biases are being clearly prejudiced against students who might have a migrant background. The subtle biases are having low expectations of these students or feeling that one's own culture is actually, when it boiled down to it, that it's, more, it's superior to the cultures that the young people come from. That is not always expressed directly, it's not always expressed overtly, but it is subconsciously and sometimes unconsciously present in the minds of teachers. That has a huge impact, especially these subtle biases have a huge impact on students because they also have a hard time understanding why, and students try to attach meaning to the behaviors of teachers, they try to attach uh, attributions, to use that word, so why is the teacher why does the teacher have low expectations? Why is the teacher teaching me this way? If the biases are overt, it's easy to say this teacher is just not very nice. I'll put it gently here. If they're subtle, it's much more difficult and students tend to blame themselves, as I did at the time, not in the initial phase, not the first year I was in the Netherlands, but after that, after I spoke the language, the fact that the teachers treated me differently, I attributed to my own behavior and to myself because I couldn't quite find the environmental cues that allowed me to have a different kind of definition of the situation. What we're dealing with throughout uh, Western world at the moment is these negative societal opinions. That uh, the attitudes towards those with the migrant background, towards refugees, especially since 2015, have become more negative. And so this is also the case among some teachers but not necessarily all, all teachers. Most teachers are very committed to their students. Nevertheless, the societal opinions are present in the everyday lives of young people. And what uh, one of the things I'm looking at right now is disinformation or fake news. And there's a lot of fake news at the moment. And a lot of that fake news that you're seeing is aimed at migrants and refugees. So those are the first two, teaching through. And this is teaching through the stories and histories of migrants and refugees. Like I said, when I first moved to the Netherlands, I did not see my own journey and my own story and my own history of moving represented in anything I read in school or any of the discussions we were having in school. So and the, to the extent that I ever did see it, it was very, very stereotypical and also did not go into any kind of real depth. I have here as a last point, when you look at history education and the connection that students with a migrant background have or a refugee background they're faced with a curriculum that is oftentimes very nationalistic not multi-perspective at all meaning that there are different uh, perspectives on different kinds of history and different perceptions of a particular history so they oftentimes very nationalistic so they are so migrants or refugees and that was also in my case don't really recognize that history education as being their own education I'm looking at the time and I'm speaking fast. I apologize for that. Um, I just want to think I, I'm going to, because of the time, I'm just going to leave this up here for 30 seconds for you to look at. And then I'm going to move to my last slide because I want Claudia to also speak. And you can write me afterwards if you'd like to discuss any of the issues that you see here. This is uh, the slide on the work that I'm doing. Uh, I will soon with the European Commission be finalizing a background paper that will be published which looks specifically at inclusion of young refugees and migrants through education. I anticipate that that background paper which uh, I should finalize should have finalized last week however because of the COVID-19 crisis uh, this is all being postponed a bit but that will be avail available and I will send it to you directly if you let me know. In addition to that background paper, we have a compendium of inspiring practices that will be published uh, in the early autumn. And many of these inspiring practices, and these are really practical approaches, and these are projects all pretty much from Europe, but not exclusively from Europe, deal with this particular issue as well. Just my final comments, because I know that Claudia also is going to talk about that. I think we're all deeply concerned for anybody who's working with refugee and migrant populations as to what are the consequences of the COVID-19 crisis 
for refugee and migrant populations. We know from earlier research that uh, if you look at refugee and migrant populations and communities, that they have less access to, uh, to computers, less access to laptops, that they don't have the same access to resources in their community. The first signals that I'm picking up from different projects I'm involved with at the moment, listening carefully to migrant uh, uh, communications and publications, is uh, that they feel that this gap that already existed between, let's say, the, those with the migrant background and those with the and the native population in uh, in Europe, especially, that that gap is increasing. Um, I know that here in the Hague, where I live, 400, and in the country, 5,200. Um, students have disappeared off the radar and that a fairly large percentage, although it's very unclear at the moment, a fairly large percentage of those 5,200 that have disappeared off the radar in the Netherlands have a migrant background. Nobody knows exactly where they are and all efforts to try to uh, reach out to the parents, to the kids, to the communities have failed to identify where these young people are at the moment, which also means that these young people are um, most likely are more likely to, uh, to drop out of school when schools do resume whenever that happens. And I'm, the last question I hear, have here for everybody is what signals are you picking up? So it's a question for everybody who's part of this discussion right now and listening in. Please, if you have information, uh, it's not only me, I know that Claudia is also part of the Sirius Network in, in Europe. Um, we're trying to see what is happening across the globe with, it, with respect to these populations in particular and trying to get a handle on that and try to get some more information on that because that's the first step in trying to, especially since I work with policymakers, seeing what we can do in terms of recommendations for policymakers now, but especially in the year to come and in the coming years. So I'm just going to leave it at that. I think that's my time. So I just want to say thank you, and I'm going to leave it now for Claudia. Thank you very much, Barry. Um, I need to, hold on, I need to. Perfect uh, timing, yes, and I'll actually a bit, uh, a bit short. Um, thank you very much for an insightful lecture and for touching upon a lot of topics. You told us about the teaching about, for, and through the stories of migrants, asylum seekers, and refugees. You also included your own stories in this journey of developing an identity and the sink and swim reality that so many migrants and refugees are still facing. You also brought forth a bit of uh, some of the myths and misunderstandings in one of those slides. I remember seeing something about the contact theory. I'm sure there are going to be a few questions about it at the end. Uh, and also for your call to gather more information on the repercussions of the COVID-19 outbreak because this is something that involves all of us. Um, and now uh, the second presentation has just been uploaded. I would like to take this opportunity to invite you to post any questions or comments you have for our first speaker. Do it right now in the chat so you can have priority. And we will now proceed with our second speaker, Claudia Keller. Claudia is a sociologist who specializes in migration, education, and youth, amongst many others, and is the executive director of the Farafina Institute a think tank working on issues of participation, well-being, and human rights of people of African origin in Europe. Recently, she has conducted comparative studies on educational opportunities of refugees in Europe, as well as youth empowerment and capacity building programs. Today, she will talk about policies and practices in education and training for social inclusion of refugees in Europe. Claudia, we are very excited to have you with us today, and the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Roxana, for the uh, introduction. I just need to... Um, my my screens are not, um, my slides are not shifting. Perhaps uh, we can have a look at the bottom left screen with the arrows, the respective arrows, and then left and right. Okay, all right. Okay, good afternoon. Um, thanks again for the introduction, for the invitation to speak at this uh, webinar. My presentation this afternoon is based on comparative studies between several EU countries on the access and opportunities uh, to succeed in education for refugees that were done uh, by the Sirius Network, which is the policy network on migrant education. Uh, the presentation also draws in price on the Back to School report that was published by uh, MPG and Corp 
co-authored by myself, which looks at education access and education tra trajectories of refugee students in Europe. And I also draw on the work of Farafina Institute with uh, refugee activists and movements, especially in the southern part of Germany. So I'll be talking a little bit more about Germany. Um, I want to start by reminding us, as simple as it sounds, that education has a high relevance for young people with a refugee background. Young people seeking international protection in Europe arrive after months and years of flight and security on trauma and um, when they arrive they most of them are highly motivated and they see education as an opportunity and as the key factor to rebuild their lives in a new environment in this sense education has important functions for them in the sense that it can pave the way towards a more stable and brighter future and also it strengthens their resilience against adversity including trafficking, which many young people with a refugee background in Europe are victims uh, of. Obviously, their access to education, integration, and educational success is heavily dependent on national legal and policy frameworks and um, also their level of implementation in the practice. And this is where we see quite a number of uh, barriers um, which um, is the reason why young people's high ambitions may quickly disappear when they are faced with legal, administrative, and practical barriers, which uh, may hinder them from continuing and succeeding in education. On the EU level, we find quite a number of directives and frameworks that guide the education of refugees and asylum seekers in the member states, and I want to mention just these four um, three directives here. Article 14 of the Directive 2013-33 uh, in its first uh, section provides that um, member states should grant children of asylum seekers and minor asylum seekers access to the education system under similar conditions as nationals. And in its second section, the same directive says that um, children entering a member state should be included in education within three months. We will look at um, how this works out in practice later on. And Article 27 of the Council Directive 2011-95 uh, provides that um, minors uh, granted refugee or subsidiary protection status should be granted access to education under the same conditions as nationals in the EU member states. Now, when we look at these uh, directives, we may gain the impression that a good basis for access and opportunities to, to succeed in education is provided for refugees. But when we look at how journeys of young refugees happen in practice, the picture is slightly different. I want to just reconstruct uh, some steps of this journey here. When young refugees arrive in Europe, um, obviously their journeys um, in most cases don't end. Um, small numbers are relocated after waiting for months before being transferred to another country. During this time, um, they are subject to insecurity and demotivation to adapt uh, to an education system that they will have to leave behind. Other young people try to reach other EU countries, um, many of them Germany, without registering at first entry points, which leaves them with no possibility to, end, to attend regular schools. Up an entry then in the destination country, the majority of young people is um, for a long time in insecure status, which prevents them from attending regular schools. Um, we find that asylum procedures according to law should uh, last up to 15 months, but when we look at practice, um, it, they mostly last 20 months. And when we add appeal periods, um, we arrive at a number of uh, three and a half or even more years of missed education. Those young people entitled to attend regular schools or training rarely receive sufficient support to bridge this gap of missed education and succeed in regular schools. This leads to high risk of low achievements and early school leaving. 
Um, I want to illustrate some of these barriers that um, we we'll see in, in these steps of the journey uh, through the voices and stories of refugees in Germany. The refugee movement in Bamberg, a city in southern Germany, formulated this statement here in regard to education. Many of us come from countries where the universal right of education for all is not granted. Access to education there depends on income, political affiliation or ethnicity. Here in Germany, we sadly realize that access to education depends on residence status. Some of us have very limited opportunities to get education, while those of us staying in camps have no opportunities at all. We're only living with the images of education in our minds. We don't want to be treated as second-class citizens. We need equal rights to education and integration. Um, I want to illustrate this now um, through the stories of two people. They are real, real people. The stories are real. I only changed the names of the people. The first one is a young girl uh, named Gabriella. She's eight years old. She was born in Italy by parents um, who were from Ghana and who were living in Italy at the time as refugees. Um, she had to go begging on the street with her mother when they were in Italy uh, because the situation um, was so difficult. When the mother was pregnant with the second child, she left Italy with the children uh, to find better chances in Germany. She was then placed in a reception center in the southern part of Germany, which we call Anker Zentrum. In those types of centers, people are not allowed to attend mainstream, mainstream schools. So for one and a half years, Gabriela only attended rudimentary camp schools. Uh, which did not allow her to acquire German language skills. In October 2019, they were then transferred out of this uh, center and for the first time, Gabriela was able to attend mainstream, mainstream school and her German language skills improved very quickly. In December of the same year, however, the family was forcefully deported to Ghana, which where uh, Gabriela had never been to before. So mother uh, is illiterate and she has nothing to start from. So they now live with friends in an informal settlement in the capital city in Ghana. Um, Gabriela does not attend school and she misses German school very much. So um, here's the, and this eight-year-old girl who attended a normal school for less than two months um, in her life and she's now out of school again. In Germany, the policies for anchor centers kept her from attending school and now deportation led to a dire situation of the family which keeps her out of school again. The second uh, case is a young man called Abdullayan. He's 24 years at the moment. He left Senegal when he was 17. After crossing the Sahara and the Mediterranean Sea, he arrived in Germany when he was 19. He was very ambitious. He attended German language courses and the vocational integration class, and he had offers and contracts for two vocational training places, both in professions where Germany needs workers. But he was not allowed to start those trainings because he's from a so-called safe country of origin and under the Dublin regulation. In December 17, he was deported to Italy. Um, he did not get an accommodation in a camp, but he received support from volunteers um, in Germany to keep him off the streets. After his asylum was rejected in Italy, um, these volunteers uh, financed a flight for him back to Senegal and organized for him to apply for a visa to return to Germany for training purposes. They got all the documents ready for him and um, after two attempts of visa application he was finally granted the visa for training purposes the volunteers financed his flight back to germany again and in january of this year he started the vocational training that he was already offered in 2017. 
So um, in the end, all looks fine now, but when we look back, we see that um, he basically wasted three years of his life moving back and forth between Germany, Italy, and Senegal because he was not allowed to start his training. And not only that, without the help of these volunteers, he would not have managed to return, even though he fulfilled all the conditions, but the barriers to get this visa for training purposes are so high that without the support by others, he would not have managed. So um, this um, and other issues are uh, the reason um, why we define legal barriers uh, where education is dependent on residence or asylum status um, as the major barrier for exercising the right to education and training for refugees. Additional to that, we increasingly see restrictive policies, um, also including high rates of returns and deportations, which prevent young people from settling in an education um, setting of a certain country. Another barrier are um, accommodation arrangements. Um, as I mentioned, in some reception centers, Mainstream schools are not allowed to attend. Some people are placed in distant or rural uh, locations where they have no access to education or training. And um, some people are transferred between different locations within a country very frequently, also preventing them from settling down. We also find high numbers of children and young people who leave um, the official system because they are feared of um, Dublin returns or deportation, which leaves them in a situation of high vulnerability and, of course, without the possibility to access education. So when we look at this, um, the article that I had mentioned before, which provides that young people should be included in education within three months after arrival, we find that there are uh, quite considerable time lag in the provision of education. Now, after pointing out um, barriers, let us uh, have a look at some supportive policies that enable access and success in education. Access to education and training independent of residence and asylum status is uh, a supportive policy that we do find in uh, some countries in the EU. Um, I put compulsory here because it does make a difference if um, education is compulsory or if there's only the, uh, the right to education. In some cases, um, if children or young people only have the right to education, access is um, considerably more difficult for them than uh, in cases where education is compulsory. Fast entry, um, here as a good practice example, Sweden, um, which has a provision um, that all young people should be included in education within one month after arrival. Tracking is, a, is an issue where we understand that um, the earlier um, education system tracks by uh, ability the more migrant and refugee students are disadvantaged. Um, so we say that late or no tracking is a, a good practice and supportive policy. We also find that coaching and support in mainstream uh, schools is uh, supportive, especially when it is obligatory that uh, a support person is placed in each school. Language, of course, is an, um, a very crucial issue, and I want to mention here uh, the um, policy um, or approach of multilingual education, which is not only beneficial for students who speak a different language than uh, the international language, uh, but um, it is supported for all children. Here, uh, the series network um, um, conducted the project um, Avior, where um, six member countries of the Sirius Network developed and uh, translated multilingual education materials, and we then 
tested and piloted these materials in different schools in those um, member countries. The materials are now available and can be used by others as well. And I think the issue of teacher qualification that we already uh, touched on. In order to um, enable opportunities to succeed in education, we also must put in place structures that make it possible that education and training connects with students' prior education and uh, skills. And uh, we also have to inform new arrivals well enough about our education systems to enable them to understand their options within the system and make informed choices. After compulsory education, um, obviously education doesn't stop. We must enable equal chances for the access to vocational and, and academic education, and this is based on ability and interest. We see at the moment that uh, policies for the education of refugees, including opportunities to stay in the country, mostly favor vocational pathways. This is good for those who want to uh, follow educational pathways, um, but uh, it makes it more difficult to enter academic pathways. At the same time, um, there are quite strict entry requirements and a lack of information about higher education opportunities. So those are factors that limit opportunities for higher education pathways for new arrivals. Before I close, I uh, just want to mention a few observations on how the corona crisis is affecting the education of refugees. Um, what we um, see as first observations uh, is that due to travel bans, many people in the asylum system across Europe are kind of on hold. This is especially um, an issue for Dublin cases. Um, during the Dublin period, uh, people have no right to access education or training. In Germany, this uh, period is usually um, six months, but in most cases it is extended to 18 months. Um, now there is the plan that um, even those 18 months will be extended for the time of travel bans, which leads to a very long time um, where uh, access to education is denied. At the same time, consultation services are closed and people are left without legal and social advice. And as Barry already mentioned, uh, virtual teaching is not easily accessible to many refugees and new arrivals. So I will close here and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Claudia, for a very thorough and insightful views on today's topic. It was particularly interesting to follow on the interplay and the dependence between law, policy, and practice. It was, it was also concerning to follow on some of the tough realities we see that refugees face when entering Europe for the first time, and also to grasp some of the key barriers for exercising the right to education and training for migrants and refugees in the case of Germany, as you presented. Uh, we will now like to proceed to the question Q&A session where we will address your hitherto comments and questions and to give you a bit of more time to write your questions. Also do state your name and country of origin if you can. I will quickly summarize again the insofar headlines. So uh, very focused on teaching about, for, and through the stories of migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers. He talked about uh, a bit of a myths and misunderstandings. We saw here, uh, we saw within your slides a bit of um, um, theories and approaches. We had the contact theory. We had zero tolerance and good intentions, uh, if they're enough or not. And on Claudia's side, she mentioned some of the most relevant EU directives that we have at hand, the dependence between law, policy, and practice, and also some of the key barriers uh, for exercising the right to education for migrants and refugees that she, she noted in her work in the case of Germany. And uh, we see that the questions are starting slowly to pop in. I will start with uh, a question coming from the UK. We have Sian here 
who would very much like to know, reflecting on both of your experiences in formal education and considering lessons learned, how can we support the integration of migrants and refugees in non-formal education? So this is a question addressed to both of you. Claudia, you want to go first? Ah, sorry. You can go ahead, Barry, if you um, have something. I th okay, I think in, in terms of uh, non-formal education, there are certain elements that I think are critical. One is for uh, formal education institutions to become aware that uh, there are nonprofit organizations, NGOs, that can assist them in terms of uh, the kinds of needs that immigrant communities have. I'll just call them immigrant communities for the moment. So it's, it's collaborating with NGOs that's necessary when it comes to non-formal education. It's critical to also think not only about what happens between 8.30 in the morning or 8.20 in the morning and three o'clock in the afternoon, but what kinds of after-school activities can happen. I know, for instance, Amnesty International has uh, human rights clubs after school. There are after-school activities uh, that also relate to other organizations. There are debate clubs after school. They can be very useful. And I worked on a, on, and you can find that online about three, four years ago with the European Commission, looking at what kinds of practices really help in combating intolerance and promoting respect for diversity. And if you Google that, European Commission, my name, you'll find that report. And we look at, I look at the evidence together with two other authors. What is the evidence out there of what really works? And what really works is this kind of collaboration, is this kind of awareness of what can be done after school as well, not only during those school hours, and also how to connect to the community. Uh, so for instance, service learning projects, which are just starting to develop in Europe, but are more common in the United States, and a whole school approach, realizing that a whole school approach is needed if, if uh, what is going to be really effective in trying to combat intolerance, trying to promote respect, trying to create inclusion. So it's, it's a full package uh, that's needed. And especially, I would also say, listening to the voices, and that's not done enough, listening to the voices of refugee communities and migrant communities, and allowing that voice to be heard, and allowing them also to really have an impact on what happens both in and outside of the schools, especially after school lessons that might take place. Claudia, yes, what is I, your take? I, yes, I, I fully support what uh, Barry is uh, saying. I uh, just thought about uh, some, some issues that I would uh, think are important to cover in non-formal education uh, from my experience in um, working uh, with young refugees. I think there are some uh, elements in education that we take for granted uh, for national um, uh, children who grew up in, in the German education system, for example, um, those are um, IT competences. Um, many people who arrive in the education system at a late um, point, um, they come with hardly any IT competences, but the education system takes this for granted uh, that those competences are um, already uh, there. Um, and then simple issues like uh, writing applications. Um, what is a CV, um, what is an application letter, and uh, the element of information about education this is something where um, non-formal providers could come in to make sure that uh, young people are really well informed about the education system and their options in the system so that their choices do not be um, only the recommendation of a, a teacher, but on what they really see um, best for their future. Thank you very much, Claudia. I hope we, they've answered your question, Sian. Um, the next question is uh, from Patras, Greece. We have Katerina, um, who is saying that although we're living in a very transformative times, a country hosting immigrants and the national education system is slow to adopt new policies that are in favor of language rights, proposing more or less monolingual teaching methods. Katerina is asking, what is your opinion on this? What would you suggest for a young teacher? Uh, if you'd like to start, Barry. Uh, 
I think it's, uh, first of all, important to realize, and, and I know that Claudia worked on the Avior project, to realize how important it is for, uh, whether it's a person who is a migrant background or a refugee background, how important language is to them. And that when you have um, a monolingual system, uh, there's actually very little recognition and, and positive recognition of a person's language abilities that uh, gets undervalued. So what you have in so many, and it's, it's actually quite rare to have true dual, dual immersion, it's called dual immersion bilingual education, where uh, individuals are immersed in two different languages. However, where you do see that take place a little bit in Sweden, um, it, it, ha it in has a positive impact on all students when that takes place. And a student who is denied his or her own language, that has a huge impact on their identity and then the performance in school. So I think uh, as much as possible where that can take place, it's not always easy. Uh, it's important to, first of all, recognize that language is important in people's lives, that it can benefit them in terms of uh, belongingness, and it can benefit them in terms of also um, academic performance. So I think it's trying to make it possible where that is, uh, where that can happen. And I know Claudia has done even more work on this issue than I have. Uh, perhaps you can develop a bit on this, Claudia, and the multilingual education system of your some of the challenges that you face, some of the success stories that you've encountered. Yes, I, I think um, it is important um, about multilingual education to understand that it's not um, only beneficial um, for, uh, um, like I mentioned in my presentation, for, speak, for children speaking a different language, but it's beneficial for all students. What we saw in the Avior project was that in several cases where um, teachers initiated a conversation with the whole class about language, there were so many issues that uh, came up and um, it was also a way of bonding for the class. It, it became much wider than uh, only the language itself, but it created an awareness for um, the benefits of diversity and for the different strengths of, the, of students who were maybe before considered as um, inferior because they didn't speak the national language uh, perfectly, but now this opened up completely new perspectives. So I think in this regard, um, it is very important and uh, there are some materials uh, that be used by, by teachers. I want to encourage also um, teachers to use on your website and to look at the materials and uh, maybe also to contribute if there are more materials that we can upload and we will also be happy to add those to the site. Can I add something to that? The, uh, the interesting phenomenon is that I was the person who evaluated the project for <laughs> the Avia project for the European <laughs> Commission. Um, first, from my personal story, that when I came to the Netherlands, I didn't speak a word of Dutch. And um, what happened is that I, I experienced status degradation. I was a very good student in the United States. I was no longer a good student because I didn't really master the language. I had one real advantage to most other people is that my mother tongue is English. So therefore, um, English has a very high status. And when I left high school, barely uh, passing my final exams, I came to the university and half my books were in English. So suddenly that low status that I had changed around again completely. Most refugees and most migrants don't have the advantage that I had. If I had had, if, um, if there had been more recognition of English throughout the curriculum of what, what I was doing, I think I would not have had that status degradation experience at the time. Nevertheless, I was fortunate. Getting back to the Avia project, one of the things that really was surprising positively surprising to me that I thought it was a tremendous advantage of what they were doing was if you think it's important and I think we do think it's important that the community is involved in the education of their children by having materials that were bilingual it brought the community into the school so often you see that immigrant communities don't see the school 
as part of their own community. You also see this a lot with Roma kids and Roma communities that in the Avrio project, it really brought the community into the school and into the educational process that was taking place with their kids in the school. So I think that was really one of the benefits of that project. Thank you very much, Barry. If you don't mind, I would like to stay a bit more on the topic because I think this very nicely relates to your presentation early on when you were talking about overt and subtle biases. You also mentioned the idea of discrimination, the idea of being labeled right, as a student, as a young student, right before you actually have the chance to develop your own identity, to being labeled and then being discriminated or, or put into specific boxes because of where you're coming from or what languages do you speak. And in that sense, maybe even hate speech uh, is, is something that is in, in the broader context. What kind of lessons are there uh, to learn from that? And what can we share with young teachers who have a lot of tools and have a lot of enthusiasm to reach out to these challenges, but they need a lot of credibility to, to uphold some, some very strong um, challenges? I think uh, for the two things that I think here are important, one is awareness, if you're talking about teachers, and what awareness of what is then the question. I, when I did the study for the European Commission on what works and what doesn't work so well, one of the most effective uh, training elements for, for teachers is to, whether it's a young teacher or an older teacher, is to realize that good intentions are not enough. I mean, we have a lot of wonderful teachers around the globe are, that are sacrificing a lot of their time and a lot of their energy and sweat to help kids. Um, nevertheless, they, too many teachers, I think, feel that if they're just motivated and they just listen to the kids a little bit and they really try to um, get the best out of them, that that's sufficient. I think what, uh, what, there's so much research, pages high, that shows that it's not enough to just have good intentions, that you really need those competences to be able to manage a classroom that is diverse, to be able to recognize when there are, and, and I've worked a lot with young people as well, that when bullying takes place, when exclusion takes place, for many kids that I've worked with, they will not talk to the teacher about it. They will not report that to the teacher because they feel the teacher does not know what to do with that information or they do something totally wrong with that information. They make the situation worse. So that's a competence that the teacher needs to have, how to deal with the tensions in the classroom, how to deal with these kinds of exclusionary mechanisms in the classroom. And in terms of training, uh, one, of the, one of the things that some research, but not enough research has been done on, if teachers become, become more aware of the subtle biases that they have and how those subtle biases impact young people and their performance and their sense of belonging and sense of belonging is really critical um, that just becoming aware of that because most are not aware of those subtle cues like looking away not making eye contact or making too much eye contact um, that that really can improve uh, the way they relate to their students um, and I think this also is related to our next question. Uh, coming from Zimbabwe, we have Ishan, Ishan Esu, if I'm pronouncing correct, Kusha, who is asking that besides all the policies, so we're t talking macroeconomic level, on migration and education, what policies are peculiar to individual countries? And perhaps, Claudia, you can a bit emphasize on the lessons learned from the case of Germany in that sense. Yes. Um, well, maybe uh, to start, what we have to understand is about the EU level and the, um, the member states level in regard to education is that the EU um, does not uh, formulate um, policies on education, but only um, directives, which are basically on the level of guidelines, uh, but um, concrete policies are in the authority of the member states. So um, this means, yes, every EU country has their own um, policies on migration and on, especially on uh, education. Um, we have made uh, some comparative um, analysis within the Serious Network um, on the different policies in the EU member states. There are a number of differences. Um, Germany is, um, I would say, more restrictive than some other countries. Um, 
airspace is also that um, we have uh, different regions, which again, uh, each has their own education policy. So we don't even really have a national education um, policy, um, but each uh, region has their own policy. So it's it's very difficult to make general statements about um, policies in Germany. Maybe I can say, maybe I can even ask Claudia um, which policies you've seen across Europe that you think are especially enlightening or inspiring. If you ask me, um, I think that Portugal has done a really excellent job recently where when you look at how they deal with a diversity in schools, and that diversity is partly defined by migrants and refugees, that they have come up with uh, uh, two different uh, initiatives that I think are very important. One is basically giving out a, a, an award, a prize, a certificate, to that the government, and this is a government initiative, that they feel are have, doing a really good job when it comes to integrating those with a diverse background. So that's number one, and they're creating a, a network of these schools that they have been, given, been giving these awards to within Portugal so that they can support each other. So I think giving out a certificate or an award like that is a recognition that schools are doing a really good job and, the, and schools need that and teachers need that kind of recognition. So I see that in Portugal. Uh, Finland is always referred to as, as an excellent model. It's hard to go into great detail, but if you look into the policies in Finland, there's a lot of focus on diversity and respecting diversity and promoting the diverse backgrounds of, of, of young people. However, when, it, when you look at the gaps between the native students in Finland and those with a migrant background, it's not all perfect. Uh, and then I would say in Sweden, when it, what you see in general among teachers is that the European population today is so diverse but if you look at the, the teachers across Europe, there's an underrepresentation of teachers from these diverse backgrounds. And in Sweden, they have developed for, especially for, for uh, teachers who have a refugee background, who many of them come from, uh, from Syria, well-trained, educated, uh, we're going to pedagogical academies, or were teachers already in Syria. They have created a fast track for these teachers into the education system. So these teachers then, uh, also become a role model for, for others in, in the school. And so, but at the moment, there's too little of that. Everywhere in Europe, also in North America, for sure, teachers who come from these kinds of diverse backgrounds in schools, there's, there's not a good representation in the schools of, of the community. Thank you very much, Barry. I think a bit of praising the, the efforts and the success stories, no matter how small they are, it's very important, especially in in today's context because we're a bit off time if everyone else agrees we're going to take two more questions five more minutes and then we're going to wrap it up uh, we have a question from Sumbata Naguzova from Kazakhstan and she was wondering what kind of practices could be applied against stigmatization and discrimination through education and in that sense uh, a follow-up question would be can dialogue be used as it, a tool on its own to help facilitate this social inclusion, or can it, should it be paired with other approaches or other uh, mechanisms? Either Barry or Claudia, whichever you like to go first. Well, I, I think um, dialogue is, uh, is very important uh, with um, students as well as uh, with parents. Uh, we did also studies in the serious network on migrant parents and uh, we looked at how migrant parents can be involved in education um, more and um, one um, issue that we found is that migrant parents often uh, don't um, feel like they are heard like uh, met uh, they come with different expect expectations in the education systems of course with different uh, backgrounds and many parents uh, don't even show up in in the school um, setting but uh, with uh, with dialogue uh, with um, things that are particularly targeted at migrant uh, parents uh, those barriers can be overcome and this uh, can be an important uh, element in um, promoting a positive image of diversity but also helping migrant students 
in uh, their educational careers? You know, it's these questions are very broad. And uh, we could be sitting here for another few hours, I think, talking about answers to them. Uh, one thing I think is important in, in confronting prejudices and stereotypes and uh, discrimination in school classes, if we're looking at school classes, and, and it gets back to good intentions are not enough. And it gets back to, if you look at the, a lot of the research on to what extent do teachers want to uh, and feel comfortable talking about these kinds of issues. And what you'll find is for the most part, teachers don't feel comfortable talking about these kinds of issues because you're in, you might be unleashing a firestorm in the classroom. It can get to be very unpredictable how, how students will respond to each other, especially if you single out certain students. Why, are you, uh, why do you have prejudice against uh, uh, kids with a Turkish background when you have five Turkish kids sitting there? Kids don't like being singled out. They don't want to engage in these kinds of conversations. So my answer, my first answer to that is teachers really, and, that go, and actually for everybody, <laughs> no matter what your field is, need to know how to create a safe space for that dialogue. How do you create a safe space in the classroom where kids feel comfortable enough to talk about their concerns, their worries? I mentioned already earlier that when exclusion takes place or bullying takes place, most, most kids don't want to talk to the teacher because their experiences of doing that have been negative. So the teachers need those skills, those competences, and they have to feel comfortable and confident to create that safe space in the classroom so they can actually, that's the starting point to talk about these kinds of issues. I think too many teachers try to jump into it because they see a problem, they see a conflict, but they don't have the conflict resolution skills. And they try it once or twice, they have a negative experience, and they get back to pure subject teaching. They don't want to deal with it. And it's understandable they don't want to deal with it. It only causes tension. Claudia mentioned the community, uh, and I mentioned service learning earlier. And I think service learning, there are different kinds of service learning, but there's one kind of service learning which I, which I really support, and that's where the school and the teachers and the, and, and the other staff in the school try to work together with the community especially migrant communities, trying to, in Spain, this is done, for instance, in the United States, trying to identify how students can assist and how teachers can assist with getting information from the community, understanding the needs of the community, and trying to reach out to the community in that way, that we are here for the community as well, and that will also bring in the community. Thank you very much, Barry, for wrapping up in, in such a, such a direct and simple way. We have a lot of questions still to answer. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. Uh, I know Nektaria from Greece had uh, some very interesting um, questions with regards to an EU passport and how would that apply to refugees. Perhaps if that's still all right with you, we can continue answering some of the questions in private. Uh, after um, the session will end. We also have your email addresses on the screen, so um, anyone who is interested can ask you questions uh, in private afterwards. Uh, in that, with that being said, I would like to thank you all for taking the time to join us today. I would like to thank our two amazing speakers, um, also our colleagues from KC for making the session possible. Please note that the webinar has been recorded and it will be made available on our YouTube channel and on an affiliated website. So if you'd like to go back on some of the ideas discussed today uh, or share within your community or within uh, your organization, you will be able to do so on KC's website and YouTube channel. This is more or less from our end. Thank you very much uh, once more. I wish you a lovely rest of the day and we will be in touch. We will make sure that if you have any other questions or comments, they will reach to our speakers. So enjoy your afternoon. Thank you once more. And we're looking forward to having you again in one of our next webinar series. Thank you.